If you're reviled, reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Amen. We are a special people chosen by God for His good pains. And we'll say more about that later this morning. But to understand that we are truly a blessed people and need to live that life. Verse 15, none of you need to suffer as a murderer. In other words, don't you dare get off into the bad things. That's not what we're here for. Amen. We're to be here for the purpose of living and showing God Amen. to the world. Brother Robinson touched on that this morning as well. I, you and I just need to prepare to notice we can do really well this morning. <laughs> Verse 16, but if you suffer as a Christian, if you really want to put that in terminology that we're more comfortable with, 
It's the same as saying if any man is put to death. Yes. I want you to know, as I looked at this lesson this morning, I don't understand what it means to suffer for Christ. Amen. I face affliction. Mm -hmm. I face sickness. Well, I face struggles in my life, but that's not persecution. Amen. I know of brothers and sisters around the world that are facing persecution. Yeah. They're facing right. death because of their belief in Jesus Christ. Amen. But I don't understand that. All right. Amen. So what I'm going to do this morning is go a little bit different. I'm not one of those academic type fellas that understands all the Greek text. Mm. Right. I'm not going to try to exegete. Oh. I'm not going to understand that's okay too. I am a practical, no nonsense, yeah. get to the point how we're supposed to live our lives in this So that's what I'm going to share this morning. And you're going to have to keep the pages turning to keep up with it. <laughs> but as we get going on this, turn to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. We understand mm -hmm. that we need to remember as Christians, when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, we put on Christ. That's important for us to stand as we get started this morning. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ Jesus. When we are baptized, we put on the sacred name of Christian. Meaning belonging to Christ. It's as if God has engraved in us your mind. Amen. That changes everything, by the way. I can't live the life I want to live or have lived in the past. I live now for Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. And that's what we're going to point to as we go along this morning. In this name, as Peter wrote, chapter 4, verse 16, we glorify God. So, question this morning as we continue. As a Christian... How do we glorify God? Amen. I got six practical thoughts. Right. If you want to write them down, do it, or you can get that $5 CD. <laughs> get that $5 CD, you can take care of it. Oh. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. This is one of the slow times. I'll turn the pages and let you get there. I am handicapped. I've tried to mess up my index finger on the left hand. I'm not trying to do this for emphasis. It's just part of where I'm at right now, so bear with me if you would. Philippians 2 and verse 5. Paul writes, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, if you go ahead and down a little bit further, he talks about you're sacrificing yourself, you're emptying yourself to be the servant to God. That's what Jesus did. But I want you to think for a moment, in just a moment as we go this morning, is to understand that we as Christians to glorify God need to have the mind through which Christ thinks. We need to have the mind through which Christ thinks. That attitude that Christ had. Then, the attitude you and I need to have as we go from day to day. That is the umbrella to our lives as Christians. How does Christ think? That's why it's important for us to have the Word open, to study the Word, to follow the Word, to look at the life of Jesus. How did He respond in certain situations? How did He live His life as a servant to God? How did He give Himself up and sacrifice Himself? And He calls for you and for me to do the exact same thing. Amen. To have the mind of Christ. If you turn one page over, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Philippians 4 and verse 8. Paul continues with this thought of an attitude. But how are we supposed to think? What are we thinking on? Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. And I dare suggest this morning that as Christians we've allowed too much of the world to invade our space. In the process of invading our space, we have lost track of purity in our thinking, of things that are lovely, of those things that are right. We have to just turn on the news in the morning. Well, I don't like that part. They get to a certain point and I turn it off. I'm tired of the news. I don't have to tell you that. We need to be very selective. The stuff that gets into our mind. And we need to focus on those good things. Having the mind of Christ in our lives. Number two. Along with the mind of Christ, the mind which through Christ thinks, we need to have a voice with which Christ speaks. In Psalm chapter 19 and verse 14, 
Psalms 19 and verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And we continue in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. I can stop right there. Can I not? Do we understand unwholesome? I'll get there. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. I have in my notes, and this is a very limited note. We need to rid ourselves, one, of falsehoods. It's discouraging. It's frustrating when I hear brothers and sisters in Christ that aren't telling the truth. Yeah. Or they're stretching the truth. Yeah. Or they're saying things that definitely lead you in the wrong direction. Yeah. Not only falsehoods, we need to rid ourselves. Oh, I'll get myself in trouble. You can catch me at the back door, I guess. <laughs> we need to rid ourselves of gossip. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I don't think we understand what gossip is anymore. But we've decided we can say whatever we want to, to whomever we want to. And we say, I'm not gossiping. Yes, you are. Yeah. We need to lose that stuff in our lives. Yeah. That's that wholesome talk of Jesus Christ. I ain't going back and talk, to, and talk about Jesus and the life he lived. He wouldn't have said anything that would have done that type of misleading. All right. He spoke to we need to be careful of the language that we use. We have to allow the world to invade our lives. And I hear Christians today that are using slang words that, oh, they're not the customary four-letter words that we hear from others. I'm doing okay then. Well, we need to examine those because if we're saying them out of anger, we're saying them out of frustration. That's not what the Lord wants either. We need to purify our speech is the bottom line. We need to begin saying those things that are lovely and encouraging and will build each other up in the Lord. We spend too much time backbiting. We want to change because we want to have the voice with which Christ speaks. In James chapter 3 and verse 11, James would write, Does a fountain sit down from the same opening, both fresh and bitter water? You can't, as was already said this morning, you can't be out in the world talking like the world and coming on Sunday morning to worship God and say it's okay. You're trying to be a fountain that sweets both waters and you can't do it. Oh, we just need to be pure in our lives in all the ways. We've got to take care of that problem. Number three, we need to have eyes through which Jesus sees, through which Christ sees in our lives. We may not talk about what we see, but oh, we need to examine. We need to have eyes that are not envious of those around us. We need to have eyes that are not caught up with the sensual ways of the world. Amen. Oh, I can go all morning. I don't have time for that, do I? We can go all morning on that. Yeah. We need to have eyes that aren't covetous to the world. Now, I, do you hear me how I keep bringing in the world? Yeah. I want you to know in the church today we have embraced the world too so much. I don't even think we realize the difference anymore. Yeah. I'm afraid that we just want to get all wrapped up. I, I look, I'm a Facebook person, but I want you to know I Facebook just to keep up with my children. Yeah. They're not the ones that write anymore, so I have to give it up. But, but on Facebook, I see Christians that spend all their time vacationing. I'm not against vacations. I love vacations. <laughs> They're going to get vacation. No. Talk to one of my elders. He knows. I have a problem with vacations, but when that's all you ever do, you begin to wonder, what are you doing for the Lord? And then if you're gone all the time on Sundays, you spend time in the Lord's church where you're at. Or you can just skip on me the next time. How about the money you spend? We're talking about covetous now. Are you caught up so much in the world? I got to have the latest car that comes out. I got to have the latest phone that comes out. I don't even understand the prices of phones nowadays. Just to take a picture or play a game is not worth it. We're missing something. But that's what our eyes are focused on. We're over again. We're just so caught up with the world and the way they think. And we need to change the way we look in our eyes. We also need to 
change the way our eyes look at others. Right. I want you to hear, and, and I'm going to look at two places in the book of Luke. The first one is Luke chapter 10, verse 33. You know the story well. It's the Good Samaritan. Right, right. And how the priest and the Levite pass on the other side. But it was a Samaritan woman. A Samaritan man in verse 33. And the Bible says he looked upon the man who was beaten with compassion. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 11. Again, a very well-known story of Jesus. Coming into the little town of Nain. And as they got there to the little town of Nain, there was a funeral procession. A right. pretty good-sized crowd following a widow that was following the casket of her son. Yes. <clears throat> and he looked upon her with compassion. Wow. Brothers and sisters, you and I need to open our eyes to the lost world and look upon them with compassion. Yes. They're lost. Amen. They're going to hell. Is that plain, was that plain enough? Yes. yes. And you and I have the answer. It's through Jesus Christ. Amen. And you and I are holding it, not giving it and sharing. Amen. Because we have lost the compassion. We see the struggles of the world yeah. and we close ourselves into the, our little building, our little walls and say, we're yeah. good. Yeah. We're not good. Yeah. We're not seeing the world as Jesus saw yeah. the world, yeah. which put him on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. There was a song that came out. <clears throat> Now I'm going to date myself a little bit, but back in the early, early 80s, I do mean early 80s, by Amy Grant. And it was titled, Her Father's Eyes. I'm just going to share with you a chorus. Eyes that find the good in things when good is not around. Eyes that find the source of help when help just can't be found. Eyes full of compassion seeing every pain, knowing what you're going through, and feeling it the same. My Father's eyes. I Amen. want the eyes of Jesus Christ. When I stand before you as a preacher of the gospel of Christ, I want to see you for who you are, Amen. the child of God. Amen. I want to see those that pass me by on the streets and on the sidewalks and in the stores. I want to see them as those who need to know Jesus Christ Amen. and need to know the hope they can have through the blood of Jesus Christ shed at Calvary. Sadly, too often we blind ourselves to the world. We're satisfied to just be about us. Amen. We need to have eyes which Christ sees through to glorify Him. Number four. We're going to turn to Luke chapter 8. I'll give you a head start. Luke chapter 8. We need to have ears through which Christ hears. We've already touched on the problems in our world and the media and the way it just highlights it, it seems like. We need to have ears that are not attuned to the voice of evil. And that goes in a lot of different ways. We need to quit hearing the negativity. I see that, again, too much on Facebook, too much on social media. Uh, our government, I, I, I know our government is what, not what we want it to be. I understand that. Would you please direct me in Scripture that tells me that everything is going to be hunky-dory? The Apostle Paul would write you, pray for him. I don't hear enough praying for our government. I hear a lot of praying. I hear a lot of complaints, but I don't hear any praying about it. We're listening to the wrong things. But not only the wrong things around the world like this, we're listening, as they pointed out this morning, we're listening sometimes to the wrong things right there in the church. We need to be about God's Word. And there we go again, I say we've got to hold the Bibles up. We've got to be reading from the Word. We've got to challenge ourselves. Know the Word. Apply it to our lives. Live for the Lord. Amen. We quit listening to those things. We're comfortable having someone tickle our ears. We need to listen to what the Bible says. In Luke chapter 8, verse 18 and 21. And I, I'm taking a little out of context, but not really. So bear with me if you would. 
Beginning in verse 16, now no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. That doesn't say anything about ears. I know, I'm with you. <laughs> For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known to come to light. And I still don't hear anything about ears. But let's go to the next part, and I find it curious, but there's a point to it. So take care how you listen. Right. All of a sudden, he's changed from this eye business, what he sees, to say, listen to what you're hearing. Yeah. He's talking about a parable he just told. Yeah. And he tells that parable, and Jesus likes going in on these parables. Who, he who has ears, let him hear. Yeah. Yeah. You and I have ears, and we need to be listening. Amen. We need to be listening to those voices that are going to help guide us to heaven. We need to shut out all the other ones. We can listen to a whole lot of songs that we don't need to be listening to on the radio. Okay? We can shut a whole lot of that stuff out. We need to quit watching some of the TV shows that we watch because of all that you hear on this. But we need to also shut out those who claim to be religious but aren't teaching the Word. We need to listen to what God is telling us to do. I'm skipping on down to verse 21, but He answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. You and I must hear God's word, be attuned to God's word, and live God's word. That brings glory to Him. Number five. We need hands with which Christ works. We are His hands. In John chapter 5, now look at a couple of passages in John. John chapter 5 in verse 17. He has just healed a man, or, or he was just healed a man. We're in verse 17. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. Jesus was a worker. I don't know that we emphasize that as much as we need to. We talk about it from time to time. We need to understand he was busy working Amen. for the Lord. In John chapter 9, just a couple of pages over, he's getting ready to heal a blind, blind man. And the apostles are questioning, but why was he born blind? I'm not worried about that part. I want you to go ahead a little bit further in verse 4. We must work the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work, and I want you to know we're there. Amen. We're there. We're there. Night is coming upon us quickly. I'm not trying to make a prophecy when the Lord's coming again. But I want you to know that time, we've already sung it, will filled with swift transition. We don't know when the Lord's coming again. But I do know that we're on borrowed time. I'm on borrowed time. I turn a year older this year. I'll be just, just a month ago. And it changes your thought for just a moment because you know something? I, I'm not going to live forever. And I am closer now than I ever was before. Yes. Yes. And so when I ask people, or when people ask me, Paul, how do you do this? I made it being busy. I stay busy. I want to be busy for the Lord. You and I need to be busy for the Lord. We're doing with the Lord with our hands, serving Him in His kingdom. That's a constant that we're dealing with. I notice in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And look at it, verses 12 and 13. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. We're going to look at two of his letters here real quick. <laughs> chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't, yeah. don't get excited yet. It's the next verse I'm looking at. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His Good place. We need to remind ourselves who we're working for. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Listen to what Paul says about the reason we've been created. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Why? For good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We're here for the reason to glorify God. We're here for the purpose of working and serving Him. Amen. There is no other reason. We Amen. worship Him, we praise Him, we glorify His name. A lot of that's with our hands. Yeah. We need to be working for the Lord. Yeah. Always busy. Yeah. If you're sitting at home, just chill. 